Uh, I don't know, maybe Dan has done that already, though, because the success that TCG has had over the last uh, five years has been simply incredible with Comcast. They started off as a direct partner of ours. We turned them into a master agent. Uh, we now have 11 master agents. They've evolved into being not even on that list to being one of the top three or four of all those masters nationwide. And it's because of you and the audience that that's occurred and, and their efforts and what they've done to support you. Uh, so I'm going to back up kind of what you've already known, and you're going to hear a lot more about products and other things as well, that what we're doing directionally. But, you know, I don't think there's ever been a more uh, significant opportunity for the channel to make money. And as good as it's been the last five, six years, it's even going to be better over the next five, six years. And that's why I think you've got a great opportunity as we go forward here. Um, but I wanted to pause for a minute because you guys had, especially those in Florida, dealt with some of this issue. And we were fortunate enough to prepare for this event. And it happened, obviously, not too long ago, where we had uh, Harvey and, and Irma in Houston and, and Florida. And we had a significant task in front of us to get our network operationalized after those storms came through. We had to lay 300,000 miles of cable, or th feet of cable, rather, in, in order to repair the down lines that were all over the place. And we had to put up our uh, uh, generator systems for all of our head ends to keep the system operational. We did all that as the storm passed. And we were up and running much more rapidly than any of our competitors. As a result, I, actually, our business, even from you, but also on the residential side, it actually surged after those storm events because customers needed someone who was up and running more quickly. And we were able to do that. And uh, that was a you know, testament to, I think, how far Comcast has come as an ease of doing business and operational and focused company over the last few years. So that storm, in many ways, while it was a challenge, certainly prepared us for a lot, and uh, hopefully you saw that with some of your customers. We got some really great responses from the, the indirect partners' customers about what experience they had after that storm. So I wanted to share that brief story with you. Um, but uh, this is the opportunity. You look at this, these numbers, they're just staggering. In fact, so, so much so that had Comcast Business been its own company, its own public company, it would have been the fastest growing company ever of any company in history at the time. And in 2006, this was a small operation, 256 million. It's now gone to over 6 billion, in part due to people in this room and others around the country. Uh, there's been tremendous surge in, in our, our revenue. You can see Comcast on the left side. We got 25 million almost uh, internet customers over uh, the US. We've got 150,000 employees, uh, 80 billion in revenue as a company, and that includes NBC Universal. But on the right side is what we do here at Comcast Business. And that's uh, growing towards 6.2 billion. We've got 2.1 million business customers, 2.1 million. We add a new uh, business class internet customer every 18 seconds. And that's due to a lot of the people in this room, others on our direct side. We've got 8,000 employees. And we've experienced, and this is probably the more notable thing and why the opportunity is so big for you, the last few years has been 16% growth rates in that revenue and in the channel much higher than even that. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity from a revenue standpoint. And this kind of shows the track of innovation and where we've come from and where we're going to. The, I wasn't here at the time, but in 2006 when we launched Business Class Internet, essentially it was then for customers who had their own pizza parlor, nail salon, what have you, they said, hey, I use Xfinity at home, can I use it at my work? That's where Comcast Business began in 2006. We evolved into then selling voice, uh, sell backhaul for wireless, obviously, cell towers. We went to 100 meg internet. We're now at a gig, by the way. Uh, we bought NGT in Denver and Simcoe in Chicago and um, added those companies to the roster. Then we launched Ethernet in 2011 at the tail end of that year. Didn't even have that. When we launched the channel, we only had coax. That was it. Um, and the story gets better as we go along. We then offered hosted voice and a number of cloud solutions in 2013. And then in 14, we did what's called wide area ethernet, where for the first time ever, Comcast would transverse the regions that we have. So like going from Florida to Denver or Florida to Chicago, we couldn't do that before. We could only do in the region itself services. That changed when that occurred. And we also launched a Wi-Fi service. Then we started a managed services outfit. We did SIP, we did voice mobility, um, and we bought a company called Contingent that has managed services is now a part of our national accounts team. 
Then we went to Office 365 and selling that, a product that's a surveillance solution called Smart Office. We added that to the roster in 2016. And now, finally, and you'll hear a lot more about this after me with Alan Langfield, SD-WAN, one of the biggest opportunities, and I've opined about it, talking about growth opportunity to replace MPLS. Huge opportunity for everyone in this room and many others out there. This is a multi-billion dollar opportunity, 13, 20 billion, depending on who you believe, on what's out there in terms of install base. And we now can marry that, and this is the big uh, monster point, is unlike the T1 world of the past for the LEC world, we now have gigabit coax in every market in the United States. So any customer who wants to move beyond the bonded T1 world can go up to a gig with Comcast in every market we're in. There's an infinite supply, obviously. Who's going to be able to use all that bandwidth up? Uh, so any customer out there that wants to expand is, is sitting in a fine footprint. All that has added up to us being the $6 billion in revenue from only 250 in 2006. A huge, great growth story, um, and part of it's due to you. But here is the sort of money slide if you want to look at the market dynamics out there. And while I uh, respect all of our competition, obviously, uh, there's been a, a surge in revenue from the cable side of the arena, not including us. We've got Spectrum as well. On the right side, you can see the install base of the major players out there and what they've got. So obviously, it's a bigger install base because they've been doing it for a longer time than 2006. But on the left side, you see the growth in revenue versus the decline in revenue. And this is where our opportunity lies, because a lot of customers are moving to cable, especially for internet connectivity, because it's uh, price competitive, and it really fits a lot of their needs for a lot of reasons. It's also redundant to the elect solutions that exist today. So you can actually win on either side, where you would sell to a customer the combination of elect solution as well as cable. And I think it makes infinite sense to do that. And obviously, you derive a commission on both ends. So this is, this is a really important slide because it shows where the market's going. This is Q2 data. But it's been tracking like this for quite some time now. And it's probably the biggest opportunity that everyone in this room has. Um, it's growth. And we expect that to, to continue. But the growth is, is phenomenal in there. We've also had great success in our channel program, which was unknown only six years ago. And most notably, this last year, we received an award. CRN is kind of the bastion of the channel. It's the uh, place where they do kind of the Oscar awards of the channel for all the technology companies, Cisco, uh, Microsoft, uh, et cetera, and Dell. And we got the award for the best player in network connectivity services, as voted on by the partners. Um, and, it, and it took hundreds of partners to get this vote. And we ended up winning uh, that award. And we've won it several times now. The growth on those charts on the lower or the uh, lower right side, that's where we started the program our first year. Uh, I don't think we did more than about two million in sales. Um, that number is approaching more than 300 million now, thanks to the people in this room and the, the success that we've had in our install base. We've had a lot of recognition in the program because we've spent a lot of time and money on this uh, initiative. And, and Comcast has invested. I started off with just a couple of people when I, when I put this program in place. And uh, we now have over 130 that are supporting all of you around the country. Uh, and that's the devotion that Comcast has. In fact, my boss often says, and our president, that they would like this channel to be 30% of our net new sales per month. Um, and that, that's a huge surge from where we are today, even as good as it is today. But there again is the money opportunity. It's, it's not that we don't want the channel to succeed. In fact, we want it to be even bigger. Uh, I don't think it's going to get to the size of you know, the Cisco's of the world where they do 90% through the channel uh, because we have over 2,000 people on the direct side that are selling. We're not going to eliminate that. And frankly, I don't want their quota. I, do, I wouldn't want to wake up every morning with that number on my head. Um, but I do think that there's a significant opportunity to do multi-multi-millions through the channel. And I think you guys can help us uh, do that. Um, and so here's some of the organization. I won't go through the whole thing, but you know, we've got a number of people on the team on the far left. Um, Kerry Tangler and his team um, run all the masters. And John Lozano, who supports TCG directly, is on that team. Then we have um, Scott Mull, who is probably the largest part of my organization, all the operational players. Uh, we've put more people on operations and ease of doing business support than any other place in the company. And those people are all in Denver, where there's a hub of telecom activity, as probably many of you know quite a few companies and competitors in the Denver area um, that are doing this. And um, Barry Williams runs all the field-based salespeople that handle all of you partners. Um, 
across the country. And then uh, finally, uh, Dalen Wirtz handles all the marketing efforts. So you add all that up and then combine that with Lee Burke, uh, who handles all our engineering team. And that's the, the 130 folks or so that we've got supporting the channel in the footprint we have. If we added spectrum to that because we don't have the whole country, uh, that number would be more than double that. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on cable in general, not just with Comcast, but with our brethren in the cable industry as well. Um, and then the directors that manage that around the country, Mike Zadoski handles this patch. Comcast is divided by what we call three divisions. One's the West, um, and we, we actually made our own division in the far West for uh, Jim Bing to manage on our team. The West, the Central, which interestingly enough, Florida is Central. It's the only company I've ever heard call Florida Central, but uh, it's, it's le legacy cable stuff. And then the Northeast uh, as well. So the three divisions with 15 regions. That's how Comcast operates. Those of you who've done our key city tours know we have these uh, folks known as RVPs, regional vice presidents. They've got the P&L, and they support us in every market to help you do what you do. And they get full credit for the sales that you do. They also want to support our efforts because it's helping them grow. So um, we, we obviously want to align closely with them as we go through it. And here's a, a quick map that shows where all of our partners are. The heat map is interesting because here in South Florida, the, the, the biggest amount of red is there. Believe it or not, there's more partners here in our program than there are in any place in the United States, which is kind of hard to believe, but it's uh, amazing how many folks are here. Uh, also in the Atlanta area, the Southeast in general, where TCG focuses, happens to be an area where we have a significant amount of partners. But all those other dots, we've got a lot too. I don't know why there's dots in South Dakota and Wyoming, because we don't have much going on there. But there are some partners located there, believe it or not. Um, but they're all over the country. And when, my, when I look at that whole base of partners, we do a lot of demographics. We do a lot of analysis on this. We have the data on it. And most of our partners have been working with their customers by virtue of uh, the surveys we do for over three years. And the reps that handle those customers, and this is why I think the channel is so valuable to Comcast, because the reps on your teams or yourselves have been working with those same customers more than six years. Our direct team doesn't have that kind of tenure with a customer. And the interesting part is that our uh, churn rate is so much lower in the channel than the direct team that that's why, of course, they value this channel so much. Because when we get a customer from you folks, we don't lose them. We keep them for a long period of time. Uh, and so do you with the commission you earn. So therefore, there's a reason on both sides to do that and to focus on the channel. The average employee size of some of these customers on the SMB side is about five employees. There's obviously a lot of business on the upper market that we're doing that's much bigger than that. The, the predominant industries are professional services, manufacturing, and retail. And that's, again, more of an issue of the fact that it's predominantly coax. There's uh, quite a few coax orders we take through the channel every month. Over 4,000 coax quarters come in from around the country every month from you and the other partners out there. And our partners, of course, sell for our competition. I won't name their names, but you know who they are because you sell for them. Um, but th that's the list. I just bring it up because um, it's important that we know who those are. Uh, most partners sell a couple orders a month. They do, uh, and again, this is out of the thousands of partners we have, nine deals a year. The average ARPU is about $2,700. And we have about 720 partners selling a month. We have uh, in Central, which is that Florida region, about 314. So interesting demographics on what's actually happening. There's quite a bit of activity going on out there. You can see the trend line since we began the program and to where we are now. Um, that line only trails off because I, I tell this joke all the time. My team gets tired of hearing it, but I put those in to sandbag to my boss so he doesn't think we're going to keep growing so the quota doesn't keep going up. But they keep giving us a bigger number every year, but commensurate with that number, they give us more resources. So every year they've asked us to deliver more with this channel, and every year they have given us more headcount to support this channel. So the investment on our end is significant. Um, the product mix has changed. In the beginning, uh, and this was a while ago, that, that line in the blue was complete because there was no fiber. Um, it's now roughly 60% coax and then roughly 40% fiber. I think that's going to at least get to 50-50, perhaps flip-flop, though SD-WAN, because of the coax uh, opportunity, may keep that involved because we've got DOCSIS uh, 3.1 to sell, but um, that number was obviously much more coax oriented in 2011, 2012, now is much more on fiber. So partners are selling you know, different ARPU-based products overall. And as far as that roadmap of the products goes, you know, our focus is, is on a couple of areas here. 
uh, looking at the customer needs. Obviously, there's a lot of customers who want to move off of DSL, T1 technology. So we've got DOCSIS 3.1 now, the gigabit technology. And that's everywhere around the country. At least it's deployed at this point. It's not fully available every single location, but should be by the end of the year as, and as we move into next year. Um, we have an MPLS alternative now, and we didn't have MPLS, and we are not wedded to MPLS. You're going to hear that later. We don't have a protection strategy. We don't have a concern about um, any of those issues because we're not going to cannibalize our base because we have no MPLS base. So we're going to go very aggressively after SD-WAN uh, in order to augment existing networks and or potentially take them out altogether as time goes on. Um, managed services is something we got into a couple years ago. We have a national accounts team that sells to big, large nationwide customers like Taco Bell, for example. Um, those managed services are not currently available to the channel, but we expect them to be soon. I'm meeting with the leader of that team. As time goes on, we're going to start selling those services that you can offer them for a commission to your customers as well. Um, and that's going to be an offering we have. And then, you know, the little secret is we do a heck of a lot of voice solutions every month, especially hosted voice, more on the direct team. We haven't had a great product with Business Voice Edge and Voice Edge Select I'll talk about in a second. Um, expect that to change significantly. Expect us to be a formidable competitor as we move into 2018 in that space and expect it to be something you're going to want to sell as you move, move through this. Our, our product vision, though, related to that um, is kind of fundamentally a few things. The, the future to us is the cloud and the applications that are resident in the cloud and then data connectivity and the networks that carry the bits. We're obviously on the networks that carry the bit side. We're not necessarily in the cloud side. We're all offering cloud solutions. But that's a fundamental precept. The other one is that gigabit broadband and software-defined networks are going to change the landscape of everything. Change the landscape of everything. And now you see VMware buying VeloCloud. You see Cisco buying Viptela. These are huge uh, tectonic plate shifts in that industry. You look at Cisco, a hardware-focused company, now, now trying to figure out how they're going to function in this new world order. They also just bought Broadsoft, who is the main uh, participant in most carriers' uh, hosted voice networks. And that says a lot about where the world is going to. Gigabit broadband is, is obviously another piece of that. And then the ability to scale with global cloud solutions and software solutions. Who knew that Comcast sells actually a plethora of software on our website? You can find it all like Office 365 can be bolted on to any customer who's buying coax or any solution we have, along with other things like backup from Mosey and others. We do sell all these things. We haven't pushed a lot of it through the channel. But that's where we're going. And then the product priorities related to that, we want to have the best last mile data products on the planet, period. And we think we're moving towards that, that vision as we go forward here. We want to have leading uh, enterprise network solutions. That's in the national account space predominantly, but things that are starting to be in our world. Also, in our world, all partners can sell into those accounts now. Any fiber opportunity, any SD-WAN opportunity. If it's a national account, we don't, we're not precluded from selling it. We put it into what we call SPA, which is a protection category. Um, registration category, and you can sell into all those accounts as long as it's fiber and SD-WAN. Not coax, but fiber and SD-WAN. That's a big opportunity for us. Um, the managed services piece I've talked about, and then the applications piece. So we're realizing that vision on the left with products on the right that we're going after this with. And the roadmap, I won't talk about all these, but who knew we had all these services? If you add them all up, it's in the high teens into 20 products. We had really three when, when I started here. Um, but it's a major change. Uh, Doxis 3.1 or D3.1. Um, PON, uh, which is our you know, kind of fiber to the edge solution. Um, and then um, SD-WAN and network function virtualization and, and virtual network functions. Alan's going to talk a lot more about that. But that's the platform. And when you look at SD-WAN today, it's not just a replacement to MPLS, but it's going to be the ability to sell many other things because once we put that in place, then we'll start selling things like unified threat management that you'll also be able to sell and get commissioned on that you can add to the customer. So when they make the choice to buy SD-WAN from Comcast, it's act one, scene one of the play. There are many more services we will be adding on to that that you can then sell. So it's a platform for the future. Um, these other solutions are significant as well. I don't have enough time to go through them all, but things like Wi-Fi Pro, um, that's something that's pretty significant. We have a new solution also that's a backup LTE solution for coax that we'll be launching fairly soon as well. These are all new services that you can add to the customer's bill 
So if you're selling them co coax, you can have uh, Wi-Fi Pro for their Wi-Fi needs as a splash page, and then you can add LTE backup as well. Uh, you can start to add these additional services for additional ARPU and start to move into a, a new direction. Um, but I did want to spend a minute on DOCSIS 3.1. Anyone know what DOCSIS stands for? I'll give you 10 bucks if you can say it right now in the next five seconds. Uh, data over cable systems interface specification. It's a cable lingo, um, version 3.1. So this is how we transmit data over a cable network. It's the, the word that the industry uses. The, the, the acronym, just like all tech acronyms, is kind of hunky, but uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, way of saying that we can move a whole hell of a lot of data over our network, and now it's up to a gigabit. Um, it's great for cloud and SD-WAN where everyone is moving to these days. Obviously, it's the platform for the future for all kinds of applications, for everything uh, that we know that is out there. And then um, we also sell Ethernet over coax as well. For those of you who don't know, um, uh, 10 meg up and down, and we're moving beyond those speeds eventually. So that, that bilateral speed, uh, synchronous speed, is something that people have wanted. You can't get that on coax, but you can get it on Ethernet over coax. So that is a service available to us. And then, of course, Ethernet in total, you can get it obviously up and down at the same speeds. Now, to, this, this is an older slide, but today uh, the DOCSIS 3.1 or the gigabit DOCSIS is available in all those markets, but pretty much everything on the right-hand side, it's been launched and it's uh, being deployed across those markets now. So it's, it's significant across the footprint overall. I mentioned uh, Voice Edge Select. It's our new version of a small business hosted voice offering. It's for three to eight seats. It's Panasonic uh, wireless handsets. And it's actually coming out very soon, like later this week or next week. Uh, it's something that you'll be able to sell. The reason this is really easy is because it can be configured very rapidly. It doesn't have the challenging elements that Voice Edge Select had. It's got a portal that's really solid for the customer to set up and easily configure the solution. And it's more designed for the small business. So any of you in that space, this is going to be an ideal product. The other product, uh, Business Voice Edge, is for a larger customer set up to over 1,000 seats. But this product's for the small business offering and um, where it fits in. And fiber is going to be a big piece of what we do also. Um, you know, this is a, an area where we're going to continue to invest heavily. Uh, PON is, is going to be our uh, network to the edge. So instead of just uh, putting coax, you're going to have Ethernet all the way and fiber all the way to the edge, really dense assets in that space as we move forward in the, in the, the build out of our network. And then, of course, Ethernet will continue to be a big focus for us. While we are investing this year over $1.2 billion in build outs nationwide, uh, that's just more footprint for you to sell and more customers to access. Uh, that, that network has grown substantially over the last few years. Every year, the, the numbers just get bigger and bigger. And speaking of futures, beyond the products, beyond the opportunity with SD-WAN, beyond the current situation going on with our market share growth, um, I think it's relevant to look back in the past, around the year 2000. Uh, I took this snapshot. These companies on the left-hand side were the leading companies who sold IT-based solutions of some sort to customers that were on the Fortune 500. The number one of all of those was IBM, and in their revenue at that time was $87 billion. You can see AT&T was a close second, HP, and so on. Um, fast forward 17 years, number one now is, is Apple. Um, and number three is Amazon. Who in the last month has bought something off of Amazon for their own needs? I mean. Whoever heard of Amazon seven years ago, eight years ago, I mean, it just, the, the change in the rapid pace is just astounding. But everything in green are companies that are net new on that list. And of course, some of them are competitors as well. But you'll see at the very bottom right, Comcast is listed there just ahead of IBM, who we weren't even on the list back in that time. So the, the rapid change is, is just enormous that's going on in the industry today. And I think in the channel in general, I came from the VAR world, from the high-tech channel world originally back in the IBM Lotus days. 
And I think this channel now is going to start taking over for what that channel used to be in selling services on behalf of service providers because the cloud-based solutions are taking over the premise-based solutions. And that means that everybody in this room can start to sell everything soup to nuts to these customers that they need beyond anything that they ever were able to do before and earn a commission for doing so. I think our business model of selling things on behalf of the service provider and earning a residual commission is going to become much more front and center than the model of rebilling and reselling of the past. I think the VARs in general are, are making that pivot. They're all becoming MSPs anyway, in some cases billing on their own. But I think more and more of it will be done this way. I think the moves by Cisco uh, most recently with Broadsoft, and then I think VMware's acquisition of VeloCloud and others just speaks volumes about where the world is going to. And then in our world, does anyone know what's common about all of these companies that's on this list? There's one thing in common. They're all going through M&A activities right now. And as you all know who have done this before, um, that can be challenging. And in our case, we don't have that. Now, we tried to do it with Spectrum. They ended up doing their own deal with Time Warner, we, or we should have said Time Warner, and that, that didn't happen. But we don't have that issue right now. We're not going through a billing platform change, a program change, a contract change, a channel structure change. We're staying steady eddy on the whole thing and continuing to move forward rapidly. It's a, it's a, it's a state of really certainty on the channel right now, something you can count on and something we're gonna take advantage of as we move through 2018. And as we move through 2018, our big focus is gonna be continuing to work on making it easier to do business with you um, and hit our ever -crease increasing quotas. They always continue to jump up. Dan's smiling right now because every time they jump on me, I tell him about them and see how we can get reciprocal help. But that's the idea of a partnership, how we have to continue to grow together. Engaging more partners, of course, we want to do that. Uh, and um, working on uh, post-sales, we're, we're looking at creating our own post-sales organization or at least support system for partners that isn't part of the mainstream Comcast system. Um, we've got a new uh, market development tool that can instantly quote services where we've already previously surveyed a site. And that's a huge advantage to be able to turn around quotes the same day rapidly. We didn't have that before. Um, if anyone is familiar with the fiber locator tool, New England Fiber used to have it, they sold it. Well, we're now going to be in that tool so you can use that tool to be able to figure out right away where our assets are. And we're going to continue to invest more in the channel to drive um, what we want to do and drive more business to you and through you. So that's kind of a snapshot of everything soup to nuts. But uh, you know, I'm going to get into more specifics here in a minute, or, or Alan Langfield will about SD-WAN. I think that's a big opportunity. Um, I was going to take some questions, but we're running a little bit short on time. So I'm going to transition over to Alan now to talk more specifically about uh, SD-WAN, because I think this is a huge opportunity for everyone in the room and a brand new product that we haven't uh, been selling until very recently and just launched uh, not too long ago. So with that, Alan Langfield. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you all. Um, Obviously, there have been a lot of, of, of trends in the industry that have really made the environment ripe for SD-WAN. You know, if we go back a number of years, typical networks were hub and spoke networks back to a centralized site where all of your firewalls existed, all of your internet backhaul went to those locations. And we've seen that radically change, right? Customers' traffic patterns have evolved beyond the simple hub and spoke network. There's lots of site-to-site -site applications. Obviously, there's public cloud, private cloud applications, and just a need for end users to directly access the internet with great performance. And that brings up another um, interesting reality, and I know I'm still subject to uh, a lot of the perception challenges we all have with the internet. We remember how poor quality uh, the internet was when thinking about transmitting data um, you know, for video or for voice applications many years ago. But the reality is all of us probably in the last week, um, and in many cases, um, you know, if you have kids, you know, you likely stream multiple 4K videos in real time at home over your home internet connection. So while the perception is, wow, the internet, it's a best effort capability, how do I get comfortable with that? The reality is the internet of today performs extremely well 
and with access to very significant amounts of bandwidth. So that's something, you know, we really need to challenge ourselves. Is our perception of things really matched with the reality of what the internet's able to do today? Um, you know, IT budgets, while they're still growing in a lot of areas, digital transformations allowing companies to, you know, grow their capabilities substantially with great efficiency, the reality is they can't keep up with the amount of bandwidth that needs to be added to these networks using traditional private network technologies like MPLS. Um, I, I just came from Detroit where um, I typically say, you know, MPLS networks can be 300 bucks per T1 and customers are still spending that. But, you know, in, in markets like Detroit and some other markets uh, in the Midwest, customers are still paying $1,000, $1,500 a month per T1. So quickly you can say, see that some of these legacy technologies just aren't able to provide the bandwidth that customers really need going forward. And it's always fun to sit down with a customer and say, hey, what would you do? Our DOCSIS 3.1 capability that, that we just talked about can go up to a gig. What would you do with the gig? And oftentimes early on in the conversation, the customer's like, I, I don't know. I, I haven't even thought of, of, of what I do with that much bandwidth. But invariably, by the end of the conversation, they're talking about some radically different things if they're able to unlock bandwidth as a constraint to their network. Whether it's doing things in real time at their branch locations, whether it's you know, real-time video, all hands, or training, um, or simply backups and real-time synchronization of data between branches that today has to be constrained overnight when no one else is using the network. So that conversation with customers about, you know, what would it unlock for them to have access to bandwidth far beyond what they can do today with traditional private line networks. Um, you know, customers also want a dynamic experience. They're not looking for what we've previously provided as an industry where we provide a pipe and once it's up, it, it's kind of up. Maybe there are reports at the end of the month saying, hey, here's how I as a service provider performed over the last month. We really want to go deeper and listening to customers, they want to understand not just how our network's performing, but how are they as customers consuming that network? What applications, what endpoints are really driving traffic on the network? What sort of performance are you seeing in those scenarios? And really helping the customer manage and understand their network so that they can get greater value out of those network resources. Um, and the last piece I'll hit on this slide is, you know, the need for uptime. It used to be, you know, the, the criteria when you talk to a customer was, well, what's your jitter packet loss and latency capabilities on the network? Um, and, and the reality is, again, internet performs extremely well, but also customer applications have largely been modernized. So applications that 10 years ago were really built to operate on private line networks, just regular T1s, and really required the MPLS quality and class of service capabilities, those have largely been redefined um, and redeveloped so that they operate very, very effectively over the public internet and other packet networking technologies. So those are all some pretty big changes that have happened, you know, if you think about over the last five to 10 years, they've really ushered in this area where leveraging public internet-based VPNs is really, really compelling, not just from a cost perspective, but what it can do for a customer um, in ways that, you know, I still think in the back of our minds, you know, we're a little bit challenged to, to embrace. So before we get into SD-WAN specifically, I want to talk about software-defined networking and network function virtualization. So you've seum, in all the media, SDN, NFV kind of plastered around a lot of places. Unfortunately, it kind of feels a little bit like uh, when you see cloud in, in a magazine, right? Cloud kind of means whatever uh, the author wants it to mean at that point in time. But I, I want to make sure you all understand why we think software-defined networking and separately, network function virtualization are key, and they're really important parts of our SD-WAN capability. We've really focused at Comcast on building a platform that leverages those two technologies. We call it Active Core. That's the service mark name for this platform. And SD-WAN is just the first product launched on this platform. But think of it as two different capabilities. The first capability, software-defined networking, is really about a term I'll call, I'll, I'll use the term orchestration. So if you think about how we've offered services to customers in the past, and I, I mean as an industry, uh, we've typically offered very siloed offerings. 
my voice offering, my data offering, maybe my video offering, my managed services, all of those were different silos managed by different teams with different technologies, with different portals. And if you really wanted to get intelligence um, about that, that solution for a customer, you wanted to make a configuration change, you likely had to deal with it product by product, and it really felt like multiple individual products. Orchestration is about really bringing multiple products together and selling it, delivering it as a total solution. So really integrating uh, many products on a single platform. That brings a lot of value to customers who can log into a single portal. They can make configuration changes across a variety of services and pull reports across those same services in a very, very integrated fashion. Great value for our customer, great value for our operations folks who are no longer isolated and siloed based on technology. The other piece, uh, network function virtualization, is all about shifting capabilities to software rather than purchasing dedicated hardware. So I think you're all familiar, you go into the back office, uh, the telco closet uh, of a lot of customers, they've got three, five, 10 different boxes from different vendors performing different tasks, and each of those boxes has dedicated hardware inside. That box, it's a firewall, that is a vendor locked box that belongs to vendor X with their proprietary technology inside, and that box will only ever be a firewall. Our approach, network function virtualization, is to say we're gonna put a very generic server, definitely a, a data center carrier grade server, but a server nonetheless at the customer prem, and the services that, that are instantiated on that box depend on the customer's needs. Um, if SD-WAN is the application they need, great. If it's SD-WAN plus firewall plus Wi-Fi management plus a voice session border controller, being able to deploy all of those ad hoc in software on a common device at the customer prem has a lot of value to a customer. It doesn't lock them into a specific solution, nor does it lock them into a particular underlying technology provider. So if their firewall technology is, is they have a preference for vendor A over vendor B, having that flexibility to do that on these common server devices at the customer prem is extremely valuable as opposed to, again, dedicated hardware devices from specific vendors. So if you, if you think about router, firewall, VPN, um, in the past, those having been three different boxes potentially from three different vendors um, and having three different management environments that you had to go into either to make configuration changes or pull data, we're really simplifying substantially to put that all onto a single device at the customer prem that is integrated from a management and reporting perspective. So let's talk a little bit about SD-WAN. Uh, I'm sure this isn't the first time you're hearing about SD-WAN. A couple of things I do want to point out. Um, SD-WAN, as I said, is just the first product that we're putting on this software-defined networking virtualized platform. Um, so being able to add other services in a highly integrated fashion with our SD-WAN capability is really important to us. But our SD-WAN capability, it, we really see it as the combination of router, firewall, and VPN topology management. Now very specifically, we made the decision that firewall, a stateful network firewall, has to be part of the SD-WAN package. Um, I've yet to see a customer use case um, that doesn't require firewall capability, so we felt it was really important that that's included in our SD-WAN offering. But if you think about the value that SD-WAN brings, it allows customers um, to leverage the public internet at each branch site for both their private traffic using VPN encryption, as well as to access the public internet for public cloud or general internet access purposes um, at each location in a secure firewalled manner. So it gives the customer lots and lots of flexibility. We've really focused at Comcast in building a capability that enables MPLS customers. So customers who have those MPLS networks that have been up and running for 10, 15, 20 years, who are looking to migrate away, or who are looking to, at a minimum, just augment their bandwidth in ways that they can't afford to do with their MPLS infrastructure. Also, again, it allows customers that failover capability 
So if they've got their MPLS network and there's a, a problem with that, everything gracefully fails over to the internet VPN capability or vice versa if there's, there's a problem with that circuit. So the flexibility of providing customers multiple WAN connections, low cost WAN connections at each location so that they can cost effectively um, add bandwidth to their network, allow failover and allow direct internet access without having to route everything through a hub site is really, really valuable to customers. Um, our SD-WAN capability is available throughout the US. Uh, it's not limited to our footprint. Um, we allow customers, if they want to bring their own internet access, bring their own um, underlay connections, that's absolutely fine, or we can provide it nationwide. So we've been uh, providing internet access nationwide through uh, the company we purchased about two and a half, three years ago called Contingent. We've been doing that for three years directly, and through Contingent, they've been doing it for about seven years. So we know how to get to sites across the country uh, that are sometimes very, very challenging to get to so that the customer doesn't have to hunt down those internet access circuits on their own. So we talked a little bit before about gig speeds uh, enabled by DOCSIS 3.1 and what that, what that enables for a customer and encourage. As you talk to a customer, understand what are they using their network for today and where are they challenged from a bandwidth perspective and really, really test what would they do with access to more bandwidth? What would they do with the gig? What would they do with 500 megs? Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting exercise. A lot of customers are currently constraining their thinking about their network because bandwidth has been so expensive. And SD-WAN really opens that up. I'm gonna jump through just in the interest of time. Um, slide real quick on value propositions. One of the elements I think is really important as you talk with customers is you really have to understand what are their challenges and their goals for their network. Because there, there are a lot of value propositions that SD-WAN um, offers. And I encourage if, if you want to take a picture of the screen, um, you know, these are some that I jotted down uh, a couple days ago. Um, but you know, SD-WAN is a very flexible product, but you really have to listen to the customer and understand where their challenges are, what their opportunities are, what their goals are for their network, so that you can best position SD-WAN. Um, I'll, I'll you know, use the, the item on, on here about you know, cost savings. SD-WAN can absolutely drive down cost savings for a lot of customers, either the operational cost savings of them no longer having to manage sites uh, via command line or through different management interfaces, bring that all together, can save some tremendous OPEX, but also just the pure bandwidth costs. However, there are a lot of customers that we talk to who they're not buying SD-WAN for the cost savings. They're buying SD-WAN because of the visibility to uh, application usage on the network or application-based routing or the graceless failover uh, that helps ensure high availability across their network. So you really wanna make sure that the, I'd, I'd call it the three or four value props um, on this list that really apply to a customer, I'd really focus on that. Because if you go in with you know, 10, 11 value props and say, hey, Mr. Miss Customer, here's what SD-WAN's gonna do for you. Unfortunately, a lot of customers are gonna look at that list and go, oh, half of this stuff doesn't even apply to me. Those aren't, those aren't part of my goals. Um, and they can very easily dismiss this as a solution. Whereas if you really focus in on what are the three or four things that really resonates with a customer's goals and network plans, you're gonna be much more successful in positioning SD-WAN with that customer. So um, I wanna save just a little bit of time for questions, because um, we typically get quite a bit and I know we're on a, a tight schedule. So I'll leave this slide up. Um, high level summary of uh, product capabilities that we've got uh, through Comcast Business Services uh, that Craig mentioned previously, but let me just open it up for questions. I don't know if Craig's still around. If uh, oh yes. So how long have you had it deployed, and in what markets did you start with? Yeah, so we we have actually been operationally deployed for about six months now. Um, prior to that, we 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 had a number of trial proof of concept customers, but we operationally launched about six months ago. We market launched uh, about two and a half months ago, and those launches were all nationwide. 
That's the great thing with SD-WAN being an over-the-top product, is we already have our broadband product and our fiber-based product available nationwide. And this was just a matter of being able to roll out those servers that I talked about at the customer prem and deliver those through an a integrated uh, portal and digital experience to our customers. Sure, any other questions? Yes. No, the question was, uh, does the service have to be deployed with Comcast Internet or can it be deployed standalone? It could absolutely be deployed entirely outside of the Comcast footprint. Um, it does require an Internet access circuit, at least, at least one Internet access circuit. We can also support any sort of private IP network the customer has or MPLS. And the underlay, the underlying circuits do not have to be Comcast circuits. We'll absolutely help, uh, you know, we'll assist and we can even procure and, and bill for any circuits even outside of our footprint, but the customer can also bring their own. Any other questions? I don't know if Craig's still in the room, if he wanted to come up since he didn't have a chance to, uh, to do Q&A. Yeah, the answer was, who's our, who's our underlying technology partners delivering the SD-WAN capability? Um, so I'm going to give you two answers to that. So our orchestration capability, so that, that, that piece of software that we, we believe is really important that powers our active core platform that really glues together multiple products in a seamless way for our customers is a company called Amdocs. Uh, Amdocs is a big telecom back office software provider. So they're providing the orchestration layer, and Versa is specifically our SD-WAN technology partner. So Versa, there's, there's a Gartner report that came out probably about a month and a half ago for folks that aren't familiar with Versa. Um, you know, one of the things they got great high marks for is their security capabilities. So we do leverage Versa for not just the VPN security capabilities, but also state, stateful network firewall capabilities. So while they might not be a household name, uh, they're extremely credible and recognized by the analyst community. Other questions? I got a question. How many people in this room are going to be selling or already are selling SD-WAN today? Uh, so we have a big opportunity. How many, how many are going to sell Comcast uh, now? <laughs> I had to ask that. Uh, and then I might add, what changes are going to go on with the product starting in Q1 next year about port availability and those sorts of things? We haven't asked that. Yeah, I think we, we, we've really focused on our digital experience. We, we built our digital experience, our portal, and we also have a mobile app. Um, you'll be seeing some advertisements, uh, Wall Street Journal and other publications uh, about soon that we've got really strong feedback on. Uh, we built that from scratch. So, you know, it's not simply rebranding or reselling someone else's technology. We've really built this internally um, in a very strong way built on customer feedback. And customer feedback was really make this as simple as, you know, a typical iPhone application. Don't make me have to go through a 300-page manual to figure out how to pull a report or how to configure a firewall rule. And as we went through, we looked at a lot of competitive products, even our own partners like Versa and said, how many clicks, how many windows, how many scrolls does it take to build a set of firewall rules? And we got a set of firewall rule creation activities that were 23 different screens and pop-up windows down to five, right? So throughout the capability, we've really tried to think through what are customers trying to do with the, with the service, with the capability, and how do we make that intuitive and simple without restricting their access to to information and configurability. So that's been a really, really important piece on us. And first quarter, we'll continue to evolve that. Yeah? So I know you guys have uh, Xfinity Mobile for the residential side. Are you ever considering moving that? I know you have the 4G backup. Are you considering actually doing mobile devices for businesses? Yeah, the question was Xfinity Mobile. Um, and are we going to do that for, for businesses? 
Um, we, we have LTE backup. I don't know what the plan is, though, for Xfinity Mobile to be a backup solution for businesses. And you may know. I don't know. Yeah, our, our Xfinity Mobile capability is an NBNO capability. So for, I'll, I'll first answer 3G, 4G backup. Uh, we'll be adding the ability for us to, to make that available to our customers um, next year, first and second quarter. That capability will be expanding as far as voice services. Um, there are plans to slowly bring that into our SMB markets, but no plans to bring that up into mid-market and enterprise and indirect yet. Um, that's still a really, really new product area. We're really happy with the success on the residential side, uh, but that's really a business built for kind of individual accounts of individual devices. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of crawl, walk, run, and, and more to come if, if we flush that out for indirect. Correct. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so if, if a customer has an LTE capability today, um, we can absolutely plug that into the SD-WAN capability. Um, we'll be providing a LTE add-on where we furnish the box, the service um, in 1Q, 2Q next year. Um, you know, we want to so, make sure a lot of the tuning on making sure SD-WAN is a chatty type of application, right? Um, you know, it's sending a lot of data analytics, um, and customers can configure it, right, with packet duplication and other technologies to really use a lot of LTE bandwidth. So we really want to make sure as we roll it out, we've got customized configurations for LTE interfaces to make sure that we don't drive up unnecessary usage on those LTE ports. Because they behave differently than a broadband circuit, obviously. we got time for one last question, I think. There is one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we have a, a mobile app right now. And if anybody wants to grab me after the talk, I can absolutely bring it up on my phone um, and you can take a look at it. Um, today, we don't allow any configuration changes on the app. Um, it's it's read-only. We don't want someone's uh, child perhaps playing Angry Birds at the grocery store to somehow uh, change a firewall rule or take down a site. Um, but it's very easy from the app um, to really troubleshoot what's going on in my network What's the performance, jitter packet loss, latency I'm seeing on a particular path? And am I seeing any impairment? Yeah, you were asking to be able to utilize, like, say, running a unified voice platform across the network. Can they actually use So, question, I believe, integration with, like, UCAS and other, other type applications. Um, we, we've done quite a bit of interoperability testing. Comcast has a couple other products about, uh, you know, video. Um, for customer locations, for security applications, um, some of our voice applications. UCAS and actually having a VPN client on your smartphone is still down the road a little bit, uh, but they're absolutely things that we're working with, with, with partners on assessing for the product. So I think we're out of time now, but thank you for all those great questions and thanks for the opportunity to address the audience and everything you do for us.